Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 285 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis, here as always with Sarah Powers. How are you doing, Sarah? Are you stressed? I mean, not right now, because I'm doing one of my favorite things, which is I'm sitting in my bed with a blanket on me, and I'm talking to you. So in the moment right now, I don't feel super stressed. In the macro zoomed out level, yeah, I think moms are stressed right now. (laughs) We sure are. You know, we've been talking, I feel like we've kind of hit on this a few times in topics lately, like... We did the two episodes about how COVID is complicating everything. Yeah. We've had some really heavy conversations in our Facebook group. And I think what really all signs are pointing to is that moms are bearing the brunt of emotional labor and mental load. And it's, it's kind of leading to burnout. And, um, and we kind of had two episodes where really all we did was say, it's a lot over and over. Like we just laid out all the problems and kind of sympathized and commiserated. And I think that has value, but I think we wanted to come back here and, and delve a little bit more into what's going on and why it feels so heavy and then actually offer some maybe help. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. If you listened to our two part episode on how COVID has complicated parenting challenges, um, you're right, Megan, we sort of identified the different ages and stages that COVID has complicated and we validated what a lot of moms are experiencing right now. What we didn't do is talk about how that manifests in our minds, in our emotions, and in our bodies. And I think that's what we haven't really addressed yet is um, the toll that this is taking and also maybe some of the ways to manage or mitigate or create an action plan for managing that this kind of prolonged stress. And I have to say, I was I was inspired by a podcast I listened to recently. We'll talk about it more later, but on Brene Brown's podcast, which is called Unlocking Us, and she interviewed these two sisters who wrote a book called Burnout. Um, But I felt like we haven't brought this kind of a conversation where we're really looking at the physical and mental toll that some of this is taking on women and moms um, and, and also talked about like what to do about that. So then you had the idea of kind of like framing it around emotional labor and mental load, which I think is really smart. So that's, that's what we're going to do today. And I think we'll spend the first half kind of defining what that looks like and maybe how it manifests for us in our bodies, in our minds, um, and then offer, offer some solutions, both that, you know, we've, we've come up with and also that we picked up, um, from these, experts that Brene had on her podcast that, I don't know, I thought what they offered was really worth talking about. So we'll get to that a little later. This is one of those things. The first time I heard the phrase emotional labor, I have to admit, I was kind of like, what is that even? That sounds made up. Um, (laughs) But when I heard it explained, it made so much sense. And emotional labor and mental load aren't the same thing, but we're kind of grouping them together because one can kind of lead to the other. Um, I've also heard um, them referred to as invisible work. So Mm -hmm. it, it really means 
the work that you don't see happening, that's happening like behind the scenes or under the surface that accompanies a task. So let's say you have a kid that needs a dentist appointment. Even if your partner or co-parent is the one who's actually going to take the kid to the dentist appointment, usually, and of course this is a generalization, but usually it's the mom who's thinking about the fact that it has to get done. She's the one who's also worried about how her child might um, react mm-hmm. at the dentist appointment. She might be worried about how her husband or partner is going to deal with her child's emotional so state true. at the dentist appointment. It's like all of that labor, that invisible work um, is piling on us, even if we're not leaving the house. It's still and anything like I could ask my kid to do a chore. And even if they do the chore beginning to end without me having to help them at all, the fact that I was the one who thought about it mm-hmm. and then has an opinion at the end puts me in charge of both the mental load and the emotional labor. So these things really do go together. And I think in most families, again, generalizing, there's just so few decisions that mom doesn't take the lead mm-hmm. on some aspect of the emotional or mental or both sides. So it's it, it can become like overwhelming, but we don't get any credit for it. No. And we don't even like on the end of my day, at the end of my day, I don't like check that off my to-do, no. to-do list. There's no feeling of accomplishment because I worried or thought it, right. it just happens. It's always running in the background. You know, when in a work setting, when you are carbon copied on emails about a project and you aren't directly involved and you might not have like a big, you know, a big task to contribute, but you're aware of all the back and forth at every step. And you're kind of picking up on the, the various things happening. And it starts to feel after a while, like it's clogging up your inbox. I feel like mom's mental load and emotional labor is like we're CC'd on life. Like we're CC'd on (laughs) all of the things that happen inside and outside our house and our inboxes are full. Some of the love it. We're (laughs) CC'd on life. Yeah. Some of those things we, we may need to jump in on the email chain. We may need to solve a problem. Many of the times it's just humming in the background because we are, we are, you know, tangentially involved in everything. And, and I love that distinction between mental load and emotional labor. We are grouping them together today, but I'll link to this article I found from the New York times. And I loved this definition. So it says the term emotional labor refers to the invisible and often undervalued work involved in keeping other people comfortable and happy. Is that not Mm. like mom's job, right? (laughs) Like that is mom. I know. So mental yeah. load is the is the remembering to remind your husband to take the kid to the dentist or whatever the thing is. Emotional labor, they use the example of a flight attendant on on a flight, because those used to be things we used to go on, airplanes, um, who of course has they have their tasks that they have to do, but they also are kind of in charge of the emotional tenor of the passenger experience. They're supposed to smile. They're supposed to keep everyone calm. If it's stressful, they have to manage emotions if there are delays or concerns. And so that is emotional labor. And I feel like in times of COVID, when emotions are running that much higher, that even if your tasks and activities haven't um, ratcheted up, I'm thinking about you, Megan, and the way you're copied on all your kids' school emails, but they don't even tell you what teacher they're talking about or what kid they're talking about. So you just get- just like general. It's just general. It's like, I'm being BCC'd really. Yeah. I can, there's nothing I can even do. I'm yeah. just being BCC'd on life. Right. Yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. um, but yeah. So I think in times like this, where our emotions are running high, um, that emotional labor of almost feeling like we're responsible for the happiness level in our homes or yes. the calmness level. And that includes, um, you know, stressful things like adults, out of work or finance Mm. stress or kids having anxiety or regression issues. It is a lot to ask of moms. It it is. And even in normal times, it would be, it it always exists and we always are taking that role, but you're so right that like right now there's just so much more. And then, um, and then to like compound that, um, I'm actually working on a, uh, an essay right now for NBC news. And I had to go out and ask people how, their family, like their extended family stresses around the holiday because of COVID. That's a whole nother thing because moms are now absorbing their in-laws being mad because they're not going to come visit Mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? Or like they're going to visit one set of the family and not the other or whatever it is. And often it's not even your family of origin, but you're still absorbing the feelings Mm -hmm. from it. Even if there's nothing you can do, even if you're not the one interacting with that family member, you're still absorbing the feelings And then, you know, let's not ignore the elephant in the room. Today is election day. It's Mm -hmm. been a particularly 
contentious election cycle. And I feel like getting on social media right now is just one big emotion absorption. Like mm-hmm. I'm actually kind of went off for the better part of the last month because I felt like a sponge and I was just sucking up so much outrage and anger all day long. And it was really affecting me. And that can turn into a labor that n- no one's even asking me to do that. Right. Labor, yes. But I'm doing it anyway. You're showing up for you're showing up emotionally and nobody even asked you to. That's such a good point. And, <laughs> and it's no like one our, even knows I'm doing it. <laughs> our bodies don't know the difference almost like our yes. bodies. I've heard that um, explained with regard to social media before. Like we're our our systems aren't smart enough to know that like this woman who tragically lost her child that I've never met is not the same as that happening in my own close friend circle. Like the stress right. response is pretty similar. And so when we are on social media a lot, you are literally like in the stress cesspool, even for things that you have no control over and don't even need to be necessarily participating in. It's just all yeah. the same. Yeah. It is. And there's just too many people. And um, there's been a lot of research done about empathy fatigue, which I won't get into too much because I don't really understand exactly where the where the fatigue starts. Um, But I think we can all agree that we have but we have it. We have empathy fatigue. We have outrage fatigue. We just have we're just fatigued emotionally. Um, And there's just a lot to it. So we we hope to do better than just saying it's a lot, though. And in part two, get into some strategies and tactics for how to deal with it. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh, yeah, Megan. I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, Sarah, before we jump into um, getting into like the science of all this, I just want to share a little story of recently how I completely melted down on a family camping trip with my siblings and their kids. So there was a lot of us um, and it was this last summer. So that made it kind of stressful because Everybody is, you know, has different levels of how cautious they were being, but everybody was trying to be pretty cautious. We had, we absolutely had to have enough sleeping space. And we come from a family where there are four siblings that vacation together with our combined 16 kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are the kind of family who would usually load everyone on top of each other, like just throw them all in tents and whatever. Like, it doesn't matter. Well, this year that wasn't going to work. Okay. So we all had to have like adequate sleeping space to spread out. We had to have enough campsites. We had to have enough tents. And it's a really long story that I won't get into too much, (laughs) except I feel like there's going to be a lot of moms listening to this, just nodding along. Mm -hmm. Basically the gist was my sister had two extra tents 
that we needed. But she was not staying with us for the first two nights. She and her husband were off doing something else. So we needed the tents and she had them. And through like this confluence of events, which included nobody had any reliable cell signal. Mm -hmm. The communication was very poor because we kept trying to get in touch. And then no one was like, if someone did talk to the other sibling, like they wouldn't tell you. So then you Mm -hmm. didn't realize that they had been able to talk to them. And okay. So anyway, and it just so happened that I was like in the shower when my sister drove through the campsite with the tents in the back of the truck and talked to my brother (laughs) who said, oh, it's cool. We don't need them. Oh gosh. And then she drove away and was gone. Like she drove like two hours away. Okay. So I come out and I'm like, do, 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 still can't get in touch with my sister. I'm like, oh gosh, I still can't get this text to go through. And my brother's like, oh, it's cool. She was just here. And I said, oh, great. So where's the tents? He's like, oh, I told her we were good. We didn't need them. (laughs) And Sarah, I lost my mind. Like I just, I was like, what do you mean? And I was so, I was so angry, like so, so, so angry that I really had to step outside of myself and say, what? Because it's not like we didn't have other solutions. The kids had hammocks. It was nice out. Kids could sleep outside, whatever. I could have slept in a tent with my family. Like there was ways to work it out. The anger level I experienced, like mm-hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't get over it. I'm mm-hmm. in the beautiful, you know, upper Michigan, enjoying this great time. And finally, so I'm talking to Jenna, who is my brother's wife. And I said, and she was just laughing at me because I just couldn't let it go. And I finally said, I just figured out what it is. I said, because you and I do all the thinking. Mm-hmm. Like everybody else just shows up and they get to have fun. And you and I are the ones planning the food, planning the sleep, like trying so hard to make this fun for everybody and to make everybody happy. And mm-hmm. to and now this year we've got the additional stress of like trying to ease people's fears and trying to like deal with all of like the different emotions happening and the different personalities. And I said, the fact that like the dude who didn't give this even one thought Mm -hmm. would dare to even say out loud, Oh, it's cool. We don't need them. Mm -hmm. It felt so insulting. Mm -hmm. I was just like, why didn't he just say, I don't know. Let me ask the experts who would have been Jenna and I. Right. And so then I accused my brother of making me take on an unfair share of emotional labor. Um, (laughs) Did you use those words? I used those exact words over the campfire. He just looked at me like, what are you talking about? He doesn't even know what that is. And it was just, it made me laugh at myself after I had finally gotten it out of my system. And it took me a couple of hours. Like it really, I stewed for a good part of the day. And I just thought it was like this microcosm experience of what life can be like when you're the one thinking of everything Mm -hmm. and, and thinking not just of like your kids, but your friends, kids and your siblings, Mm -hmm. kids and the kids in your community. And And the people in your community and all this stuff. And like people are blase. They think, oh, it'll just work out. And the reason it'll just work out is because you will make it work out. Yep. And that was the part I felt like was just, and guess what? In the end, I still made it work out. And in the end, like the guys just really didn't have to think about it too much. And I guess I could say the lesson to me is to not care, um, to care less and make them take over, but then they wouldn't. Right. (laughs) So I still would have been stuck. So I guess I just wanted to share that story because I'm a pretty laid back person. Mm -hmm. I am not someone who gets overly mad about like travel details, not working out. I'm very go with the flow, but when there's that many emotions to manage and something so simple goes awry, I like, can't, I just couldn't deal with it. It really made me feel crazy. So sharing that, because I bet everyone has a story like that. I love that you shared it. I think Um, anytime we share a story of our own personal meltdowns and we have many times on this show, um, we always get really nice emails. (laughs) Like we, I don't know if people just feel sorry for (laughs) us or, or if, or if sharing a story of like when you really weren't at your best, like you really lost it is just, I think it's some of all of you listening at some of your favorite things. So, um, I'm glad that I'm glad that you did it, Megan. Um, well, yeah, (laughs) I think what we're experiencing now seven or eight months in to COVID is that this has always been a thing for many moms and we're generalizing here, but many, many parents and many working parents and many busy parents have felt this kind of drip, 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 death by a thousand cuts, all of the school details, all the pickup and the drop off details. I think what's different now is our surge capacity is depleted. Like we've talked about in past episodes, we have less patience to draw on We have less creativity and less flexibility and less like mojo for life. 
Um, I was just going to share that we, um, our mornings are just not working right now. And mornings have never been a super pain point. You guys all know, listening, my kids wake up early. I wake up early. It's not that hard for me to get kids out to out the door in the morning, but it has been hard since the kids have um, been back in school in person. And first my younger two went back and now my middle schooler's back. And I can't put my finger on exactly why it doesn't feel like it's clicking yet. But one of the things that I think is going on is like you said, I'm the only one who knows all the things. And that includes my partner, but also my kids who are older now. I'm the one with all of the information and there's so many more details. We have to leave. I have three different drop-offs because COVID has made drop-offs staggered. They have to remember a mask. They have to like every, each little detail that COVID has added combined with our, our fatigue, like you said, um, it just makes coping that much harder. So, um, yeah, I I mean, I, I, where do we go from here? Yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's that our search capacity is low. There are more details, but also the mental and the ante has been upped because if we screw it up, we're not just making our kids momentarily uncomfortable. We could infect somebody. Like yeah. the fact that that, you know, or we could really make someone mad. Like if we're talking like the political um, spectrum or whatever's going on right now, like saying the wrong thing could have a very deleterious effect. Like it's just, it's very, everything feels very, very fraught. Um, and I think we do feel that in our bodies. Like, and we know that we do, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, but really what it does and what we're going to talk about with the the podcast that you, the Brene Brown podcast episode that you mentioned is really what the stress cycle mm -hmm. is. And I had never like really, I mean, I've heard of the stress cycle, but I had never made the connection between dealing with stressors, meaning having to go all the way through the cycle. I think mm -hmm. a lot of us try to circumvent it. We try mm -hmm. to go, okay, I'm starting to get stressed out. How can I not be stressed? Mm -hmm. I have to cut this off. and they make a very different argument, which is like, you need to actually go through the whole cycle in order to move past it. If you don't, then you basically are just going to get stuck and spin in it. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like, um, on the emotional side, I'm thinking about this term, emotional labor and, and the invisible work required in keeping other people comfortable and happy. I have noticed for myself, that I am more protective of my kids, uh, happiness, I guess is the right word, mm -hmm. mental, mental health, mental stability than I was before COVID. And so I find myself jumping through hoops a bit more to what's the new term in parenting, snowplow parenting, or like not helicopter yeah. in and save the day, but, but try to ensure that they don't, they themselves aren't feeling additional stressors, but guess what? Like the the net amount of stressors are still there. I've just decided to absorb a few more of them. For example, like my middle schooler not wanting to be five minutes late in the morning. I, in past times, might have said, you know what? This is just the time that I can drop you off. You're not truly late to class. You're just a little later than you'd like to be, blah, 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 suck it up. And I, I feel like I don't want to do that because I want her, I want her to be happy. And that did not used to be like a motivator for me. I've never been um, a parent who struggles with kind of holding boundaries with my kids in that way, but they've gone through so much. That's what I keep feeling. It's like my kids have already had so much taken away this year that I then take on more emotional labor to make sure they're more comfortable on that. I'm like the flight attendant and they are the comfortable passengers. <laughs> you know, you know, what's funny about that, Sarah, I would usually be the, the mom who really likes to make my kids happy. I have had almost the opposite mm, interesting. reaction to where I find myself getting really annoyed with them when I feel like, like, I want to say, yeah, everyone's suffering, right? Like, buck up, you know, like suck it up, buttercup. And I have actually seen arguments play out online about whether our kids have actually sacrificed much or not. Like I literally mm. saw this play out the other day where someone was like, stop talking about how much our kids have lost. If we don't, if we keep using that language, then they won't learn resilience. And they, you know, from a global perspective, they really haven't had it that hard. Right. And then literally like one post later, someone was making the exact opposite argument. And then I got emotionally involved in their <laughs> argument. It was like, <laughs> like the emotional, like, um, uh, like energy it took for me to care about what these adults I barely know have to say about the way I should interact with my kids was getting in the way of me interacting with my kids the way I wanted to. It was very strange. And I, that's what I think that 
you know, an abundance of opinions that will always, I will always hit my tipping point where I can't handle it anymore. Too many opinions just will like blow my brain up because I want to give all opinions their due and to honor them and validate them. Mm -hmm. But like when there's too many and they're too strongly felt my, it's like I short circuit and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's to believe or what to listen to. And then, so yeah, that was kind of a moment where I said, doesn't, this doesn't matter. Like none of this stuff outside my house can really matter that much to me right now. Yeah. Um, which means you have to take a big step back and that's, yeah. and that can be hard to do in, in such times, such unprecedented times as, as these, these, as these yes. are. So let's define, let's, let's define a couple of things. Cause I'm excited to move into some of the science we learned from this podcast episode and, um, and kind of share that with our listeners. So first of all, in case you missed it, we're mentioning a podcast episode called Burnout and How to Complete the Stress Cycle. And it was Brene Brown interviewing two identical twin sisters who have expertise in different areas, which was one of the things I really enjoyed about the interview. Oh, were they identical twins? Mm -hmm. I wondered why they looked so alike in yeah. the cover. Art. Emily yeah. and Amelia okay. <laughs> Nagoski, and they have okay. different backgrounds as, as re researchers, but I believe they're both PhD or both doctorate. Um, in different fields. Um, but so something, so s one distinction I learned that I think now is a good time to define is in our stress. When we talk about quote unquote stress, there are stressors and then there is the stress response. Did that, did I say that right? Or the stress cycle? Um, I think so. So the stressor is the, well, wouldn't the stressor be the thing creating the stress? Yes. Okay, so, yeah. but they are two different things. So the, the stressor, I'm just going to use an example. If you are outside playing in the front yard and your two-year-old runs out in the street and you have that momentary panic, the yeah. stressor, the, the stressful thing that happened is the car going by your two-year-old running out in the street. Um, the stress response in your body is that heart beating, you know, hands sweating. You probably right. yelled at your kid. We've talked about those moments. You, you freak out. Um, just because the stressor is over, the car, the child is safe, the car is gone. Um, the stress response in your body may still be happening. It also yes. may be delayed if you, if you, and that's what we're going to get into is that stress cycle in your body is meant to complete. It's meant to say, okay, we are safe now. Phew. And it's meant to like have a natural conclusion in your body. And many times for us, it doesn't either because we don't give ourselves time and space or sometimes because the stressors are so plink, plink, plink. They're so death by a thousand cuts. They use the example of you're continuing to expose yourself to the same stressors day after day. So you really don't ever have like a break, like going to going right. to work with an abusive boss or something would be yeah. an example of like you're never you never complete that stress cycle in your body with your emotions because you're constantly exposed to it. Um, so I thought that was an interesting discussion that we think, well, the stress is over, like you know, I gave my big presentation or I turned in my book deal, but often we have not completed the stress cycle in our bodies, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. I, I actually, that for me was something I had never quite given this amount of thought to because I know what stress feels like. Mm -hmm. Like I know what it feels like to be afraid your kid is going to get hit by a car or to have something that nags at you. Like we all know what that feels like. But what I had never thought about was the fact that like, until the cycle completes, it doesn't stop. And right. they, they talked a little bit about um, fight, flight, or freeze, which I know we've all heard of. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, you know, one of the uh, examples you often hear is like a prey, a predator and prey. Mm -hmm. um, you say it's a, a deer running from a, what, what do deer run away from? Let's, mm. I think they use the gazelle running away from the lion. So they could run. They could fight. A gazelle's not going to fight a lion. So right. they're probably going to, they're going to run or they're going to freeze. And, and the, the thing I thought was so interesting is that they were saying, um, we have this very like Americanized, um, that we idealize the fight, mm -hmm. like the turning around and, and taking it head on and dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And we kind of tend to like see fly, like fleeing or freezing as somehow less than, but their point was like, these are all like morally neutral. Yes, None they're of them, equal. The, yeah. They're one equal. is not better than the other. They're just different right. responses. They're just different responses. And the thing is, if say you chose to freeze, um, you may not like come back to life till the threat is gone. Right. Mm -hmm. So like a gazelle might lay down and pretend to be dead. And then when the lion goes away, the gazelle gets up and runs away. Mm -hmm. Right. But like 
if if you're in a situation where you freeze, how do you know the lion is gone? Like, yeah. what is the what is the equivalent to that? Do you just like move on and try to pretend like it didn't happen? I think that there is kind of that um, tendency for us to just be like, well, that's over. Move yeah. on. And we don't take the time to see it through. Yep. No, I, I agree. And I, I mean, I I think we've talked about on this show, like you are, you tend to be really easily in touch with your emotions, Megan, or you've, I won't put words in your mouth, but you've said that you are, I tend to have a harder time with that. And they really made a connection between feeling your, feeling your feelings, which we've all heard is a good thing to do, but as so essential to completing that stress cycle. So if you are a type of person more like me, who wants to get the job done and move on and doesn't necessarily pause to feel the more emotional side of things, um, that can really challenge the completing the stress cycle because you don't have the emotional cue. If you are crying or um, feel really super angry or something, you're feeling that emotional response physically in your body and it's, it's easily identifiable. If you're stuffing or avoiding, you it's going to show up in other ways, either through physical stress or exhaustion. Like you said, you know, freezing in the form of just like zoning out on your phone. We we've talked about that. So, um, it's all tied together. These, these emotions and the physical stress cycle. Well, one other thing that they did mention, and I, and I agree, I am very comfortable with emotions. Um, however, it's also possible to get stuck feeding an emotion. So yeah. like you can go too far in the other direction. Mm-hmm. And I have definitely had that experience. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in part two, but like where I have gotten myself so into a feeling that I can't get out of it. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, like I'm, I'm purposely deliberately giving it fuel. Mm-hmm. And that isn't always helpful either. In the case of me being really mad. It takes a lot to make me mad. But once I, when I finally get there, I kind of sometimes don't want to stop being mad. Like it's like, I can't let it go. Like Mm -hmm. I'm like a dog with a bone. So, um, I think, or, or sad. I remember having in the past, having had like playlists that I would just listen to so I could get really really Mm -hmm. sad. And sometimes that's really therapeutic and good, but if you don't want to be sad anymore, you have to complete the sadness. Like you have to end it. You can't just keep feeding it. Right. And so those are like, those are, I think two sides of the same. So same side or two sides of the same coin. I agree. So I want to tie these two ideas together before we go to our break. We've we've talked about emotional labor being the the invisible work to keep everyone else happy, basically. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about a uh, stress cycle in our own bodies not having a chance to complete or resolve itself or come back to neutral, I guess. Um when one goes up, when the emotion when the amount of emotional labor that we're doing goes up, I would think that the ability to complete the stress cycle goes way down because if we're now also responsible for everybody else's feelings in the Mm. house and everybody else's equilibrium, there is literally no moment of the day where our body says, Oh, the tiger's gone. Like I can, I can relax. I'm almost getting like emotional saying it out loud. Like there's no, there's no space for moms to, and there's such a mind body connection here. Cause I think a lot of, at least I'm so cerebral. I think of these as thoughts and ideas in my head, but there's also the body to say like, Oh, I can, I can relax. Like in yoga, when they yeah. tell you to like relax your face and you're like, Holy crap. I didn't even know my face was tense. And it is, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Well, and to your point about trying to make your kids happy, um, or trying to make other people happy or just being surrounded by people all the time who have feelings, it might not even be your tiger. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, we start to kind of take on other people's predators and not even be able to di- distinguish, like, is that my, is that my, t- my <laughs> lion or my toddler's lion? I don't know because I'm just around these small people all the time. And I can't, like, I can't distinguish anymore, which feelings are mine and which feelings I'm mm. absorbing from other people. Um, I think if you're an empath, that's particularly difficult, but even if you're not, and especially if you're not someone who's dealt with that, I feel like it would be harder. Mm-hmm. Like if that wasn't something like if you'd always been pretty good at separating your feelings from the people's around you and making that distinction, but now you don't have the time to do that or mm-hmm. they're around too much or there's just too many feelings. Like there's the stew of feelings is just too thick and you can't distinguish what you're feeling from what everybody else is. That almost feels like it could be really disoriented for mm-hmm. someone, disorienting for someone who didn't usually deal with that. So it's very complicated. It is. 
Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. All right. So we're going to jump into some tips and obviously we will link up that podcast episode so you can go listen to the whole thing. I really do recommend it because we're, we're just pulling some of the things that stood out to us. Um, but basically the, the goal that both you and I took away, Megan, from listening to the interview was that we want to finish the feeling, whatever the feeling, the emotion, the stress rep- response was, we want to allow it to fully complete. And I kind of mentioned that earlier when I talked about, you know, feel the feels, feeling the feeling, yeah. um, being able yep. to identify that you're even having an emotion, which I know that sounds yeah. silly, but sometimes for people like me, that is uh, the first challenge. And also to not to run away, not to stuff it down and not to beat yourself up for having the feeling. So that's kind of the goal, I guess. And then what, what we'll talk about. And then about. if you're like me, allow yourself to end it. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> allow yourself to move past it because and not get stuck in it, which yeah. can also be a challenge on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So so that's kind of the goal. And if we are able to do that, then we're the, then we're not running around with our stress hormones and our stress level at this at this humming level. But we're kind of each stressor is allowing itself to complete and then we're ready. <laughs> ready for the next one, 2020. Um, So they offered a few different proven strategies for kind of finishing the feeling. Do you want to throw one out and we'll just banter about it? Yeah. um, Well, the one that I think, you know, stood out to me the most um, just because of all the yoga that I've been doing (laughs) for the last couple of years was, was breathing. Yeah. Um, And I, I I love that they said, you know, you don't have to meditate. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do a mindfulness exercise. Those are great but literally just breathing. Like Mm -hmm. there is research that shows if you just complete your breaths, you know, if you tune in, think about your breath, make sure you're breathing all the way in and all the way out. A lot of us hold our breath Mm -hmm. or like the, the length in and the length out aren't the same. And I think it can be a really interesting exercise to just count, you know, like Mm -hmm. take a minute to just count, uh, to five on the in and count to five on the out. And Um, what I have loved about doing breathing exercises in yoga is that it shows me where I tend to catch my breath. Like where is it that I'm trying to like double breathe in Mm -hmm. or is it that I try to breathe, you know, out and I don't complete the out breath. Like, I think that we all have our own little, um, idiosyncrasies Mm -hmm. when we breathe, Sarah, I think you're a double intake breather. I'll hear, I'll hear you do that sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you're like, like it's I, like a little gas gasp. I definitely have breathing issues or or respond to stress <laughs> with breathing issues. Yeah. Well, and I, I I wonder sometimes if it's like because you're just trying to make sure you have enough, which it's not like that's not a problem. I mean, maybe that's just the way you breathe. But like it's something that I think we probably all have our own little mm-hmm. weirdnesses about and just being aware of it so that next time you're feeling like super stressed, maybe you just think, am I breathing? Like, am I completing a full breath? Well, not only that, but I loved that they said you don't have to sit and do a five minute guided meditation every day. They they came right out and said that. So you could be driving in your car and just kind of stressing about something. And if you decide to intentionally breathe in and out for a few minutes while you're driving, you don't have to do it by a method. You don't have to have a chime going. You can just you don't have it's not even meditation. It's just focusing on your breathing. literally just breathing and that that is effective. Well, just that it, that it has an actual like 
physiological effect, even if it's not some big meditation practice. That was really helpful for me to hear too. Yeah. And I think that that breathing, um, and they didn't mention this, but like, I think that there's that mind body connection that can also, um, be tied to muscle clenching. Mm -hmm. And it just made me think of a couple yoga classes ago that I was at. Um, the, the teacher was, had us do this, uh, this exercise where she had us breathe really slowly and then relax our faces. So she's like, just relax your whole body and breathe really slowly. And then she's like, try to make yourself angry, but don't breathe faster and don't tense anything up. Oh, interesting. And she said, you know, the person, I can't remember who the, um, who the expert was that she borrowed this from, but she said, he says it's impossible. Mm. And I have to tell you, when I was concentrating only on breathing and not tensing anything up, I couldn't even think of anything to make me angry. Like it was so much work just to like, just to breathe and think about breathing and to like relax everything that I thought how it was almost like, I thought, how would I get angry right now? Like if I really wanted to reflect on something that would make me angry, I would have to start breathing faster or something would have to tense for me to even get there. Mm -hmm. So it's not gonna, you know, you want to feel your feelings and you don't want to like trick yourself out of feeling but sometimes it's nice to like short circuit something a little bit, like mm -hmm. just to hit the reset button. So yeah. yeah, just, just breathing, just like taking your shoulders down from around your ears, right? Um, relaxing your hands. Mm -hmm. Like I clench my hands and mm -hmm. fists a lot and don't realize I'm doing it. I sometimes even clench my toes. Yeah. So there's just a lot of things physically happening with us yeah. that we can, we can relax and choose to focus on and can help help that. Right. No, complete. And that's a great example of you may think that that you really aren't having an emotional reaction anymore. You can feel like, OK, I'm done with that silly comment that I read on Facebook. I don't feel angry about it anymore. But your body doesn't know that yet. So that's right. a great way to like bring your body to the place where you are emotionally, mentally. Um, so speaking of physical, I want to talk about physical activity because I loved that they acknowledge and I don't remember which sister, but one sister said that she is one of the people who has a true um, is it cortisol, like a true cortisol, like, um, like, like an endorphin endorphin. Thank you. Like, yes. Um, you don't release. want the cortisol. You do want the, endorphin. thank you. A true endorphin, almost euphoric response to, um, strenuous exercise, like a, like a cardio run. And the other sister was like, I don't have that at all. And I was so glad she said that because I don't either. I wish I had the thing where strenuous exercise put me in a better mood um, and I know people for whom it is, it's like A plus B equals C. It's, it's a, such an easy connection for them to make that they just make it a non-negotiable part of their self-care routine. For me, that would be more like sleep. Sleep would be something where it's like, it is a guaranteed way to make me feel better is to get a good night's sleep. But I don't feel that way about exercise. So I love that they acknowledge that not all of these is necessarily going to be the ticket for all of us, but maybe you find the one or two or three that do work for you. So I don't, I don't know about you if you feel that endorphin um, or that stress release when you exercise, Megan. I have never had the high. Yeah. I've been waiting and it <laughs> never has happened. So we're the same. Um, yeah, I, here, but here's another distinction I would make. I think there's a lot of value in moving, yeah. even if you never get that, mm -hmm. but if you move hoping for it and it doesn't come, <laughs> it can be very demoralizing. And so, you know, that I was, I was actually running for like yeah. most of the summer, um, like the whole last half of the summer, well into the fall. Then I had a weird, like, I kind of didn't feel great two weeks ago and I had like some weird joint pain, which is gone now, but like, it kind of took me off of mm -hmm. my, took me off of my game. And I really thought about it and it was like, I enjoyed the fact that like I did something I hadn't done before. I tried running. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I, I made progress pretty fast. Like there were all these things I liked about the accomplishment of being able to suddenly be able to run, you know, more than a mile without feeling like I'm going to die. Like that felt good. The running part never felt good. Yeah. I never cared for it. And it's not the same as going to a yoga class where I feel like I'm dancing mm -hmm. or like, um, where the way I'm moving my body feels very satisfying in a completely different way than my feet hitting the pavement. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just had to realize like, and it's not to say I'll never take up running again. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll just go out and run on a lark just cause, but like running isn't going to turn into something I love. Mm -hmm. And that's like totally okay because the mental energy it took for me to just keep putting one foot in front of the other kind of took away some of the joy of exercise. Like mm -hmm. when I go out for a walk, I like to look around. I like to like 
listen to the birds. I like to kind of zone out. And I was not able to do that when I was running. I really was thinking about my pace and like my breathing like the whole time, which maybe I would have eventually gotten over, but why? Yeah. (laughs) I don't need it. I don't have to run. Right. So I think that not all physical activity is the same. And you might find like Sarah, you used to dance. You used to love dancing. There was probably something in that physical expression that felt really good for you in a way that like a hardcore, you know, Peloton, like a spinning class or something isn't going to do. Right. And I think that's kind of where I am too. Like, I don't need to work that hard. Yeah. 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 And, and of course we know that strenuous physical activity is, is great for most of us for lots of reasons. I just thought it was interesting that some people can feel the direct emotional kind of release and like come back after a run and feel mentally and emotionally so much better. And some people may not, doesn't mean it's, it's not good for us. It's, it's probably good for us no matter what, um, just like, you know, breathing and just like these other things. But I thought it was just interesting like that yeah. not everybody feels that euphoric response or whatever. Yeah. Um, another one they mentioned was laughter and they, they specifically said real laughter, not the fake kind you do for social lubrication, which I think mm. is interesting. And, um, I, I know that Oftentimes we do feel like we kind of have to chuckle at things around other people or laugh at their jokes or, <laughs> yeah. but like there is such a difference between that and that feeling you get when you just laugh really hard mm-hmm. at a ridiculous conversation or a funny movie. And I think that's why shows like Shit's Creek, just for example, it's 20 minutes per episode or whatever, but you can watch one and it's going to make you guffaw mm-hmm. a few times and you're going to feel so good during and after. And there's, There's a reason why that stuff is so addictive Mm -hmm. and and so like universally addictive. Mm -hmm. Um, It just feels really good. On the flip side, they mentioned crying. And um, one of the sisters, I I can't remember which one it was, the the less emotional one was saying like, it's really hard for her to even like, it's hard for her to cry because then she'll start to think about the emotions and like, she can't tune into them. Mm -hmm. So she said, just pay attention to what's happening when you're crying. Like, tears, like how much snot's running out of your nose. She said, or is your face flushed? How many tears are you producing? That made me laugh because I would literally never think that way right. if I was crying. But for someone who maybe was a little more disconnected from the emotional side, that allows you to go through it and then let it end. Um, and for me, it might be the benefit there might be me going, wow, I'm crying really hard. And, and kind of taking a more detached view mm-hmm. from it might and be helpful wallowing. for me to let like, it end. Yeah. And not it, wallowing and not feeding it. Yeah. 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 Um, I love that laughter and crying are, they were, I think they talked about them as part of the same like way, you know, they're very, very, um, connected. Um, I was just thinking before we recorded this episode, we were recording some of our wonderful sponsor spots and we have some of the biggest laughs when we're messing up and we're like behind the scenes and we're trying to get our act together with our, you know, outline. And it is a physical, I was just thinking about like, when was the last time I laughed really hard? And it was like an hour ago, we're in a recording session and you and I, it's not always like, it's not always the podcast that people hear, but we almost always have a point where like, I'm literally crying, laughing, like my, like I'm, my stomach is going. So that makes, that makes this job very fun. And it does. And then it makes, doesn't it feel like it makes you go into the episode we usually do the ads before, just a little behind yeah. the scenes. We usually record ads first to kind of warm up. And then we have all these laughs and yeah. it kind of gets us in the mood. And then I feel like when we come to the episode, we're like relaxed. Like yeah. we're ready to do this, this part of the job. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it, there's something about that, that laughter and camaraderie. Yeah. And um, I've never cried out of sadness over an ad. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so upset that I cried, not from laughing, but you know, it, could happen. It could. It could happen. There's there's a first time for everything. Um, okay, well, this one's related because often we're laughing with people we love, but positive social interaction and true connection um, is another way they talked about completing the stress cycle because your body picks up on cues that you are safe. If you are if yes. you are talking easily, happily with you know, friends or even just making eye contact and sharing a short exchange with like the barista at the coffee shop, your body's picking up physical cues that you're in a safe social environment. And especially if you are not in a safe social environment, a lot of your day, either because work is stressful or your kids are pulling on you or you're isolated and you haven't had any social interaction that cues your body that you are 
home, like quote unquote home. I don't necessarily yes. mean in your home. And I thought that was really powerful. And it also makes me a little sad because we are living through a time where a lot of people are really starved for positive social interaction. Yeah. Um, but I think if, if we can, add a little goal to just seek out those moments of connection. Maybe it's a phone call instead of staring at Instagram, or maybe it's just intentionally um, complimenting somebody and having a short exchange, you know, when we do pop into the store. So I think we have to maybe look yeah. a little harder for it, but knowing that it has physiological effects on, on our stressed out bodies, I think was really interesting. Um, is this yeah. also the section where they talked about the 20 second hug? Do you remember them talking about the 20 second hug? Um, I don't, I don't know that it was in this sec. Okay. I don't remember that. I don't, so I don't think it was in that Let's revisit that. Cause I want, I, at some point I want to talk about the 20 second hug, but I think in this case they mean more out in the world socially. So I don't yeah. think you're probably not going to 20 second hug your barista, but. No, not right now. <laughs> not right now. But they, you know, uh, I did think that it, I liked that they took the pressure off by saying it really could just be a quick exchange with someone who's pleasant. And like, it's just like a, it's just a quick exchange with another human mm -hmm. that makes you feel human. And I think, um, right now it's hard to get those in person interactions. A lot of people aren't really leaving their houses. Um, even so it's like, how do you, how do you do that? And one thing that made me, um, that I just thought of when you were saying it's, you know, so much better than scrolling Instagram. I think the problem with something like scrolling Instagram is it's one-sided, like mm -hmm. one person is broadcasting and you are consuming. It's not really an interaction. And there's a difference between even that and the way I feel when I send a text, like yeah. a funny text to someone I really know and love, or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm friends with, I will have a big smile on my face because they sent me something that I thought was funny in a mm -hmm. text. And it was meant just for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't broadcast out to the world. That was like an interaction just for me. And it's, it, it is that safe, special connectedness. Like I belong feeling. Yes that I just don't think you can get from social media. Like right. no matter how good it is, um, you know, no matter how small someone's following is, they're not putting something on Instagram literally just for you. No, agreed. And I would so. also say that we can, we can attempt to achieve some of this in our own homes because remember we've talked, I, I don't remember how many episodes ago about the kind of checking out mentally, even when your family's all around you, especially in these COVID yeah. times where we are in the same house as people, but that doesn't mean we're connected. So I think um, with a little intentionality, we can also have some of these positive interactions right with our own family and our own kids. And yeah. maybe it's just putting the phone away for a little bit or making more eye contact or shaking up the routine so that you're going for a walk in the middle of the day when you're you know, spouse is also on a lunch break or, you know, yeah. I don't know. I hate that. it. I hate that it kind of sounds like a to-do list item because now we have more emotional labor. But if we know that it is good for our selves yeah. and our bodies, mm -hmm. then maybe worth a shot. And nobody likes the way they feel. Like I was just thinking the other day about how many times lately my kids have said to me, mom, you already asked me that because mm. I have now these things, you know, they're kind of coming in and out while I'm doing my thing. And I have this like list of questions I rattle off and mm -hmm. I know that I'm doing it. And, um, I'm, I'm like momming the conversation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, what's going on with you? What have you got planned this afternoon? How is school going? Like I have all these questions that I ask and I will repeat myself mm -hmm. and my kids have called me out on it. And it didn't used to be this bad. I think it's because we all used to go away <laughs> and then had things to talk about when we mm -hmm. came all back together. But now none of it, none of us really have that much to talk about because yeah. I know what they're up to. I can see it. They're like literally right in front of me. So it's like, you know, I, I think that there's some, no one likes that feeling. So I think there's really something to, even if it, you kind of got to pencil it in and put it on the schedule just to have that connection. I think mm -hmm. that the benefits are probably worth yeah. weighing this. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. So the last one was, um, creative expression. And we all know what that is. It's whether that's like you know, um, painting or singing or writing or, um, cooking, knitting, cooking. Yeah. There's a million ways that you can creatively express yourself. I loved, <laughs> she said, uh, one of the sisters said knit little booties made of your rage, <laughs> which made me laugh really hard, but like it is a way to pour yourself and in, into something that is outside of yourself. And I think that's very powerful. And then she also used one of my very favorite Carrie Fisher quotes, which is take your broken heart and make it into art. And I have to tell you, I have literally said that out loud to myself in the past when I've Aww. been like upset about something. I will repeat that. I think I saw Diane Keaton say it. Okay. Like she was 
it was some acceptance speech a few years ago. And it really just stuck with me because it, it is a way to take what you're feeling and turn it into something. It not only completes the cycle, but it feels like you did a thing, Mm -hmm. you know, it Mm -hmm. feels productive. It feels, um, useful. Mm -hmm. And I think we like to feel that way. You know, absolutely. I think a struggle for a lot of moms is we think maybe we used to be creative or we used Mm -hmm. to, you know, do this, this extracurricular, this hobby, this leisure pastime. And now I think for a lot of moms, if you haven't done it in a while, um, creative expression can be hard to find. Like, okay, I know it's good for me. I want to do it, but where do I even start? So it could be as simple as one of those adult coloring books. There's a reason they became super bestsellers. Um, I, I learned from you, Megan, to buy the super fine point Sharpies to use in those adult coloring books, which I, I, I don't know why it just felt like, like, wrong to color in a coloring book with Sharpies. Cause I think of Sharpies as like for a totally different purpose, but the fine point, the re- ultra fine point Sharpies work great for those coloring books and they're very satisfying. So it could be something it's satisfying because the color is so vibrant and yeah. like it, no and matter it what, the tiny it spaces. Nice, <laughs> yes. And no matter what about those, um, no matter whether it's colored pencil or even crayon in those books, whatever you do looks amazing. <laughs> like you almost can't not have it look amazing in the end. So that's what, like, it's so satisfying because you're using a million different colors and the, the, you know, you're filling in these teeny spaces. And at the end you look at it, you're like, wow, I am so good. Yes. But yes. Agreed. <laughs> um, I'm going to make an argument for singing because there is a, for singing in groups is probably going to be one of the last things to come back in COVID times. And I know it's a huge yes. part of your life, Megan. Um, I am, I am someone who gets serious physical enjoyment out of singing, but I have to look for it because I don't perform like you do. I just like to sing. And then if you have kids around and they are older and they tell you to stop singing and they've been doing school at home, like you may have to look for the shower opportunity to sing in the shower or go sing in the car. But if you haven't like belted something out to your favorite song in a while, I'm just going to recommend that. I think it fills like three of these five, uh, maybe all, maybe singing could fill all of these tips because it's good for your breathing. It's, right. um, you could laugh at yourself while you're singing. Yes, I guess it's not I positive it. social interaction. We'll have to wait for No, it is. Well, you know what I think, um, family karaoke machine. Yeah. There is something about an in-home karaoke machine that will get your kids singing. Yeah. Cause there's like a microphone and then maybe you could do it just to be goofy and make them laugh or cry yeah. at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, making a playlist of, so- at one point, um, in a particularly str- when I was having a lot of trouble with stress and anxiety, I made a playlist of songs purely that I thought my voice sounded good while singing. Like they're not even like my favorite songs, but songs that I really, really love to sing. Um, and, and if I was by myself in the house, I would just sing. So there you go. There's a vote for, for singing. I love it. Well, it's time to wrap up. I do want to take some of these into my own stress management. I don't know how you feel about that, Megan, but I, I think I learned a lot from that podcast and I'm glad we had a chance to share it with our listeners. Um, I think sometimes the first step is just like realizing like, holy moly, my body is carrying a lot of stress right now. Well, that's what I think. Yeah. I, I think it it's taking that leap from saying so much is happening. Why do I feel so bad Yes, to saying, wow, this is why I feel so bad. So much is happening. Yes. Right? Like that's such then, a good way to put it. Yeah. And then once you get there, then you can go, okay, now what do I do about it? And even if it's just one of these things, like mm-hmm. even if it's just breathing, like mm-hmm. if you just spend the next few days really every time you start to feel really stressed thinking about just slowing your breath down and paying attention to it, it, it will help. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe you can add something on when you get, when you get the benefits from one, you can add on the next. Mm -hmm. Um, cause this shouldn't feel like a chore or a to-do list. It should feel like the thing that feels good and makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Um, well, we are having our virtual retreat coming up this Saturday. So if you are listening right when this episode drops, just to let you know, we are taking registrations for a couple more days. Um, and even if you just decide to do it at home and shut the door and ask for a few hours of peace and quiet within your own home, um, I think you could still get a lot out of it. A lot of the content is pre-recorded and coming kind of pre-packaged for you. So you could really do it kind of on your own time. Um, so wanted to mention that kind of a last call, probably just the next couple of days. And the it's the momhour.com slash virtual retreat, or just look for the link in the show notes and we'll make sure you know how to get there. 
get on it. And if you're listening to this, when that has is well behind us, we'll keep you posted on the next one. And of course, we'll share how it went and all of that. So thanks for listening, everybody. And we will be back this Friday with a Voices interview episode and then again on Sunday with a More Than Mom. So we'll talk to you more later this week. Hi, friends. Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Tease Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Tease Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasemade.com to find all those episodes. The Tease Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Tease Made. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour.